Welcome, everybody, and I have the great honor and privilege to interview today a wonderful fantasy author by the name of B.G. Franklin. He is the author of the Azalon book series. Uh, currently, there are two books out right now, book one called Azalon, Rise of the Mountain God, and book two, Azalon, The Shattered Accord. They can both be found on Amazon, and again, I have the great privilege today of interviewing Mr. Franklin. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to start nice and easy and uh, because the listeners really like to get on a somewhat personal level with, with the writers. Um, for Absolutely. example, you know, uh, I love Tolkien and it was interesting mm-hmm. to know something about Tolkien. So I'd like to, if you can take just a minute, please, and tell the listeners a little bit about who Brian Franklin is. What, what makes Brian Franklin an author? Well, it's, it's, um, it's a fairly new endeavor for me. I, huh. I started writing a couple years ago. Um, however, I am a, I'm a history major, so I, I'm versed in, you know, researching, writing, um, you know, telling factual stories. Um, but this, this part of my writing and how it really came to me, um, kicked off kind of with the pandemic. I mean, Right. It seemed like one day the whole world shut down. And as it did, a lot of things that a lot of people like to do um, weren't available anymore. I was a I was a high school and college athlete. Um, and one of my great stress relievers was to be able to go to the gym after work or whatever it may be. Right. And with that taken away, um, I had to find kind of another avenue or or something to kind of bide my time. And my father actually is an author as well. Um, and he writes, he writes Westerns. Oh. And so that kind of put the bug in my mind. And, um, then the story of Azalom just kind of occurred organically in my head. It was, it was, uh, something that I started thinking about. And, um, I figured, you know what? I'm going to try to <laughs> try to put pen to paper and, and make this story into something that's actually real and presentable okay so you're <laughs> so you're saying you've never done anything prior as far as being published before no. aslam wow well yeah wonderful job <laughs> well, <laughs> well wonderful. You know, i i went in and i thought and when i started writing the first book i i originally had intended just to write one book but um <laughs> as i had outlined my story and it started to grow I realized that I've I've got a whole series here. So oh, shades! Point, <laughs> yeah, shades of Tolkien. <laughs> yeah. So by that point, I, I realized I'd bitten off a lot, but yeah. um, I, I'm bound and determined to see it through and make sure it's a great story for everybody. Okay. So okay. So this basically started, I guess it would be safe to say, about two years ago. Then, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah. More or less. Yeah. Um, how quickly before we get into the nitty gritty of the book, how quickly were you, how quick were you able to write the first book? Cause it does um, not feel rushed. I can tell you <laughs> any of the listeners who are, are, are queuing in on this now, this is not a rushed book. It is a beautifully written book. So how long did it take you to write it? Well, I, when I realized what I wanted to do, I sat down for about three or four months with just kind of a notepad and pen and really took the time to develop my characters, um, develop the world, essentially. Right. I had to create a world for them to live in. And so I took about three or four months to, to plan everything out and re- and discover where I wanted my story to go. Um, when I started writing, obviously, I, I would say the first five chapters probably took as long as it took to write the rest of the book in the sense that <laughs> been there <laughs> when you get started, you know, you really, you gotta, you gotta learn how to do it and you gotta feel your way through it and you make a lot of mistakes. And, yep. and I, once I kind of got my rhythm going, I think I wrote the first draft of the book in about six months. Wonderful. Wonderful. Yeah. Well, it, it, it is excellent. Again, it doesn't feel rushed at all. Um, okay. So let's go ahead. Um, I think I know this question. I'm going to actually get talking about the book. You know what? Let's do that first. Tell us about the book one. As I said, uh, as I've told the listeners, this is the, uh, and if I say this correctly, the Azalom series. Yes. Sir. All right. And so we have, 
uh, book one, and it is called uh, Aslam, Rise of the Mountain God. And then there is currently, we also have book two out, right? Yes. Sir. Okay, and the book two is Aslam, the, the Shattered Accord. So I'm currently uh, well into the first book and enjoying it very, very much. So, But for the listeners, go ahead if you would. Let's take a moment out and um, let's talk about the, the first book, and then we'll I'll get into some other questions here. So tell us the main plot. What's the book all about? Well, um, it's, it's a fairly classic hero's journey. Um, our protagonist is the book begins with him as a child and it, it develops the world and, and okay, shows and go, the reader and, and go ahead and say his name, the main character, uh, Barrick. Barrick. That's right. Barrick. So and yeah. He, okay, good. When the book starts, he's a, he's a 10 year old boy. Um, and he lives in an agricultural community in a small town or actually kind of a village at the time. Um, but there's essentially an empire that rules the earth that's, well, it's not the earth, but the world that they live in. And they're on another continent to the east. Um, when I was planning this out, I took shades of the American Revolution in the sense right. that the Western continent is essentially kind of an untamed land. Um, it's very agricultural. It's small communities. But they're ruled from a ruler who's across the sea to the east. Right. Um, now, with that, they're they're they they pay a lot of taxes. They um they're censored in a lot of ways. They can't speak bad about the king. Um, it's it's a tyrannical kind of society. Right. Now, Beric he lives out on the far western edge of it, so he doesn't see it quite as much as a child. But it starts to affect his life uh, more and more so is is he grows um so a series of events happen that are that are fairly traumatic for him and kind of force him onto this hero's journey it's not something he was ever expecting to do i think he'd have been fairly satisfied just living in a small village for his entire life but the in that the situation most, didn't allow it that's kind of most heroes it gets thrust upon you yes yeah he he doesn't have much of a say about it, but once it is thrust upon him, he is ready to answer the call. All right. Okay. And uh, so um, what? why did you pick this particular theme? Okay. So I, I get it that you're a historian, right? Mm -hmm. um, is, is that what you are by trade? Is that what you are by profession? Um, it's not what I am by profession. It's it's just more of a hobby or an interest of me. Oh, I get it. I get yeah, it. I'm yeah. I'm a historian as well. Um, yeah. So, why did you pick this particular genre? You know, this particular. Why did you start this well, kind of series? <laughs> yeah, I. Um, you know, I've always I've always had a great appreciation for the for the fantasy genre. Right. Um, I, I'm aging myself a little bit, but being a kid, in, <laughs> but being a kid in the eighties was a great time. Um, we had, we had great movies. We had great video games. Oh, good grief. Yes. Out. Yeah. Yeah. So there, there were a couple things that stuck with me from that time. Um, you know, I grew up, I was a legend of Zelda fan and <laughs> I loved Conan the barbarian. And, right. And then, you know, there were some kind of off the wall movies that came out. One of them in particular really struck me. And that was a uh, legend with Tom Cruise and uh, Tim Curry. I love it to this day. Yeah. And, you know, it's it's kind of an off the wall movie. But I mean, it really it really scared me as a kid because the villain was so great. Um, well, especially if you see the 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 director's cut, it's different than the theatrical cut. There's I, actually a director's. I hope they have it on Amazon. <laughs> oh yeah, because the director's cut is much darker. The music is, is much it? darker. <laughs> oh wow! Yeah, well, I know what I'll be doing after this interview. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and they they actually do, and that's how I got it. They actually do have the DVD or Blu-ray with both on it. So just make sure it has the director's version of okay. it. Okay, it's it's a very different feel, but I love them both. Yeah, and you and you know movies like that. Um, and I read The Hobbit. Oh and, yeah. And fell in love with it, um, as the rest of the Western world has. <laughs> right. um, but that was something that kind of stuck with me. And I realized when I started to plan out Azalom that I kind of had this wealth of knowledge in the genre that I had never really used for anything besides my own personal entertainment. So it was a lot of fun creating the book, um, creating the characters, the plot line, the towns, the, the story altogether. 
And a lot of it is drawn upon just influences that I've had in the fantasy world, whether it be movies or games or books or even the music. So. Right. Well, prior to the pandemic, it's interesting that you, you actually put it that way. Um, I guess because that you were then locked down, you were at home and mm-hmm. you, uh, why did you, and I think it's great. Why did you choose writing as your avenue of release, you know, of be able to yep. do well, something else? Well, um, there was, there was my, like I said, my father's an author and he writes Westerns, but he wrote a book called So To My Love, which actually is the story of how he met my mother and, and it was it was really um, it was really moving for me because I was reading a book about the story of how I came to be <laughs> in <laughs> essence. Um, and I I just remember thinking what a great legacy piece that is to have in my family. Um, besides his westerns, which are great, absolutely to have the story <clears throat> of us. And I have a four year old four year old daughter, and I realized that. that you know, I think I would, I would like to leave something for her legacy wise. You know, everyone has professions and they have possessions and, sure. and you go through life gathering things. But I think having a story that's written for her and she's actually one of the kind of the main characters in it, um, is based off of her. Um, I just think it's a great thing that, that she'll always have long after I'm gone. Oh, that's so. wonderful. Well, that's that's very much. I imagine you probably know this very much, like J.R.R. Tolkien. He wrote them for mm-hmm. his children. Uh, that's yeah. the the Hobbit was originally written for that reason. And uh, what a legacy to leave behind. Yeah, I just I I think it's wonderful. It's something she'll always have. And um, even now, I tell her, you know, hey, I'm working on the story about you, and <laughs> she gets really excited. And she's not quite old enough to read it yet, but but she gets really excited. Well, that's awesome. So you uh, tell us a little bit more about book one. So he's, he has this hero quest, you know, basically Mm -hmm. pushed upon him and uh, what, uh, without giving a whole lot of the book away, what does this quest entail? What is he meant to do? Um, He, he's, he suffers a personal tragedy where he loses someone who's very close to him. Right. Um, but in, in the events that unfold, he actually, um, comes into confrontation with, with the dominion who kind of rules the world. And he actually ends up fighting and killing some legionnaires, which is the dominion army. Um, this is something that hasn't been done in thousands of years. Or a thousand years, approximately. Yeah, I actually enjoyed um, that part. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I very really, heroic. I had to, I had to uh, create some history, but Barracks, when Barracks begins his journey, the continent that he lives on, the Western continent, Athlon, is kind of at a tipping point. Um, the people have to show up once a month for a collection day, where they essentially are taxed and have to give anywhere from a third to a half of whatever they produce. So if it's, if you're a rancher, you're handing over cattle or sheep or whatever it right. may be. Um, and this is, this has been a customary practice of, of these tariffs, but the continent reaches a tipping point where the dominion begins to um, conscript uh, children and that's kind of enough for these people. Okay. They're, they're fine with giving away, you know, so much of their produce or whatever it is that they bring to these collection days. But the moment that children start getting taken, um, right. it takes a dark turn on the continent. And now the people as a whole are beginning to turn. Um, and that coincides with, with Barrick's journey in the sense that he's grown up with this. He's, he's seen it firsthand, kind of the tragedy and the terror of it. Um, so when he loses someone close to him, it becomes a, it becomes kind of a, at first it's a quest of survival. I'm, his whole goal is to, to stay right. alive. Um, but as the story unfolds, he, he will turn and go more to the offensive because they realize that the world they live in is unsustainable for them. Right. Okay. So it's, it's safe to say that this is, would you call this book, uh, 
it truly in the fantasy genre or it is an alternative reality? Um, what would you um, define this? I, I, the series, I think definitely falls in the fantasy genre. Um, the first book does not show as much magic or, right. or some of the creatures and characters that are going to come into play throughout the series. But, the, but it lays the groundwork for the world that we're in. And as the story goes, more of the magic elements and some of these other creatures begin to appear throughout the story. Okay. Without giving anything away, just so that people know what to kind of look forward to, what are some of the, the fantasy characteristics? What kind of creatures can they look forward to? Um, well, I, I, writing fantasy, I drew a lot upon you know, things that I've read or, or watched. Um, but Wonderful. I kind of had a couple rules for myself. I wanted to stay away from elves <laughs> and I wanted to, <laughs> I, I wanted to stay away from dwarves and dragons. I get so, it. It's, yeah. it's, it's been written a little bit about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They, they appear everywhere. Um, so I've kind of, I've kind of created, um, well, I created one race who lives far oh, wonderful. to the West. Um, and they're, they're called the Dovians because right. they live in, in yep. the forest of Dover. And what a Dovian actually is, um, is it appears as what we would call a lichen or a werewolf. Um, but it's not just a raw beast. It's essentially a, a man wolf hybrid, um, that a, would appear as a werewolf, but essentially mostly walks on two feet. They can speak. They have have all the reasoning and intellect that um, a man would. So their society is kind of pushed off to the Western edge of the world. Um, and they're actually protected um, through, through the accord, which is an agreement with the dominion that was struck hundreds of years earlier um, at the end of a conflict they had where the dominion would not travel West of the Athlon mountain range, right. which pretty much runs the continent as the Rockies would in North America. Um, and with that, the Dovians will not go east of the range. So they've been, they've been separated for quite some time, but um, the Dovians are, a, they're, they're a race that's, um, they're very family oriented. They, they care about their pack. Um, and they essentially live in this forest untouched until until the second book. Okay, this kind of it's a start of an answer to a question that I was actually going to ask you here shortly. And that's: Do you try to, which you obviously do, do you try to be original or deliver? The question would actually be: Do you try to be original? Or do you try to give the readers what they want? Okay. And I get a little mm -hmm. from you is that you, you want to give the reader something, but you really want to be original. You don't want to do the same thing over and over again. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, it's a fine line to walk. It is. Um, uh, I think, I think the reader, you know, from whatever background they may come from can identify with kind of the fight for freedom. Right. Uh, the, it's, it's something that, that people want. They want the freedom to make their own choices and live their own lives. Um, with that, I, I've taken certain elements from the fantasy genre that, that I like, and I've stayed away from other ones that I think, you know, may be overplayed or, or right. unoriginal. And so I've, I've created, um, some new races and elements in my story that will be new to the reader, but any, any reader of fantasy will be able to identify very quickly with them. Um, and a lot of the rules of the world are very similar to other fantasy stories they may have read before. Okay. All right. <clears throat> the, the very fact that you're doing this as a series. So an important mm -hmm. question might be, <clears throat> do you want each book, and, and I'll explain the question here, do you want each book to stand on its own or are you trying to build a body of work with connections between each book. For example, <clears throat> you know, Tolkien, when he originally wrote, I don't mean to be alluding to him each time, but I'm trying to help explain to the readers. Mm -hmm. When he originally wrote, you know, The Lord of the Rings, it was really meant to be one book. <laughs> and of course, mm -hmm. the publisher went, no, <laughs> this is not going to yeah. work. <laughs> so they were broken up into three books. And it's easy to say, at least from my point of view, each book does not stand on its own. They require 
if you mm-hmm. want to get into book two, you really need to have read book one. What would you say about yours? Um, I, I would say that Aslam follows the same path. Exactly. Um, right. That's it's, what I it's not, it's, I, I put in a lot of work to the history of the world as you well. You did. Beautiful too. So, mm-hmm. so to go and pick up the second or third book and just begin reading, <laughs> um, there would be a lot that would be lost to the reader and would really be unfair to them. So I would just suggest start with one. Right. And, and get the backstory of the world. And that'll, that'll help your reader identify and connect with the characters as well. All right. There you go. I, I absolutely agree. And one of the beauties of the way you're writing, and it's for myself uh, as a reader, it's very important. I enjoy, and I won't, I won't get into a series that, and I don't mean to say this against any particular writer, but has a level of superficialness to it. Uh, I like a book that is that has a very rich history that I see mm-hmm. character development, that a character is not just two dimensional, but they grow, which yours mm-hmm. definitely does. Did not want to get into this is forced in this situation, doing things that, as you just said, has not been done historically in a long time. Mm-hmm. And you see a growth within the character and your history mm-hmm. makes for a very rich and textured world. I, yeah. Well, I, you know, like I said, I take things, I, that I like and I stay away from things that I don't like um, when it comes to other other books or movies, whatever it may be. And one of the things that's important with Barrick is, um, you know, even though he's this, he's kind of a muscle bound, strong kid, um, there's a very human side to him. And that's important to show because you meet him when he's 10 years old but about two-thirds of the way through the first book the story actually jumps 13 years so when we reconnect with Beric he's now in his early 20s um so it really gave me a chance to add a lot of depth to his story um sure he's he's a hero and he's he's brave and he has honor and courage and and everything that you would expect but you get to see some intimate moments Right. Um, in his personality of, of how he deals with tragedy, um, and how he grows as a person. And that's important. Very good. I, I appreciate that. Um, what kind of research did you, okay. Uh, yeah. You start this about two years ago and, uh, you obviously had uh, some free time on your hands in order yeah. to be able to do this. And I love how you, you use that time. Did this require, and again, I guess being a historian from way back, it does help. Did you have to do any special research to, to do this particular, especially book one, since this is where you're laying out the world, you're creating the world? Yeah. Well, I, I really had to, I had to establish the rules of the world. Um, right. So essentially there's, there's kind of two competing theories here. Um, the dominion on the Eastern continent has a mineral. Um, that essentially allows them to, it, it works as it can heal them, but when they ingest it, it also kind of works to boost up whatever natural capability they may have. So typically Dominion Legionnaires, the soldiers who, who ingest this mineral, they're, they're stronger, they're bigger, they're faster, and it gives them an edge. Um, so I had to determine how does this mineral, what are, what are the properties of it? Um, right. So, so I, I studied some geology, geology, and even though this is kind of a, you know, it's a magical mineral, um, it was important to learn about, about some geology. Um, and then on the other side, the magic in the world has essentially been outlawed. So you don't see it early on, but it still exists within the world. Um, so I really had to also kind of lay the ground rules for how the magic works. You know, do people have it? Can they learn it? Where where does it come from? Can they use it ad nauseum or, or does it take an effect on them? Um, So there were a lot of ground rules I had to lay down before I even start writing anything. Well, I think that's important, even in a fantasy world, that there is some element of truth that Mm -hmm. allows it, makes it easier for us to suspend disbelief. Okay, mm-hmm. well, I can see a rock do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. and, and and that's that's that was kind of a goal of mine. I um I wanted to write um a fantasy story and series 
that even though there's magical elements to it, it's, it's somewhat believable for the normal person. Right. Um, you know, I have to, I had to figure out how do my characters get from point A to point B and what's their motivation for going there and when they get there. Um, my brother and I kind of have a running joke about, you know, why didn't they just take the Eagles to Mordor? Um, <laughs> Very much so. Oh, yes. <laughs> and, and so he, he was giving me a hard time on the phone, you know, like, well, are you going to have some Eagles that show up and just kind of save the day when you need them to? <laughs> and I said, I'm going to I'm going to try to uh, try to avoid that in my story. I want it to feel plausible. So as Barrick and Hemsey are on this journey, <laughs> um, the reader can feel that they're actually with them right. and and get the most out of the story that they can. Well, if Tolkien had done that with the Eagles, we would not be talking about him right now. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Well, they, and you know, Peter Jackson did a great job oh. throwing him into the movie. Yeah, the abso movie. absolutely. I'm not one of those purists that went, oh my, they, they veered from the story. <laughs> yeah. I think he did an amazing job. All right. And on that note, um, let me see how, it it can be one person. It can be multiple. Who would you say, if you could pick, would be your muse? Somebody that, who has inspired you. I mean, I kind of hear your daughter as part of is a little bit of your muse here. Yeah. Um, you know, I the the example that my father said. True. The, the, he's been a great father to me, and Wonderful. he's left a body of work that I'm always going to have. That was um, that was very inspirational. Um, my my daughter's part of it as well um but i think ultimately the most exciting thing about writing this series is 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 that it's kind of made me feel young at heart in the sense that when you can when you can re-spark your imagination later in life um it's it's a wonderful thing and it's been a lot of fun you know especially with the pandemic i know a lot of people um have struggled and and had a hard time right um, so this has really just been a gift that I've given to myself in the sense that regardless of what's happening in the world and, and daily life and your job and your bills and everything that you have to deal with, um, this has just been a wonderful escape for me okay. where I can, I can come home and I can get behind my computer and put on some music and start writing and, um, and kind of leave the world I'm in, I okay. guess you could say. All right. That, that is a wonderful lead into my next question. Do you view writing? I know for myself, I have, and I know other authors have as well. Would you kind of sounding like the answer would be yes here that you view writing as either kind of a cleansing or a spiritual process, something healing or cathartic for yourself? You know, I, I, I do. Um, in the, in the sense that one, it, it makes me feel younger than I actually am. Um, <laughs> but, but it really, it kind of brings back a part of me, the childlike part of me that, you know, right. on a Sunday morning when, you know, you fired up your Nintendo and started playing Final Fantasy or whatever it may be, it was, it was special and it was fun. And it's special and fun for me now, these many years later, to write and, and create my own story. So, Absolutely. Oh, my. Mm -hmm. When I was that young, there were no Nintendos. <laughs> <laughs> yep. But I think that's wonderful and does bring you back. Do you, without naming names, do you feel that there, do you base any of your characters even loosely on people you know, real people? Um, I do. I do. Um, obviously, Emma is based off my daughter. Um, sure. Right. What, you know, she may be someday as a grown woman. <laughs> um, right. But, but I served, um, 11 years in the U S army. Oh, um, right. In that time, in that time, you know, I, I worked with a ton of just, just great guys and, you know, different personalities from, from all over the country and the world even. Um, so with that sense, when, when I was creating the characters, I didn't necessarily sit down and go, you know, I, Barrick's going to be like this person or Hemsey's going to be like this person. But as I started to write them and develop their, um, I guess just kind of organically develop their there character. Right. I drew upon, you know, certain people that I've known. Um, and it really, really made it easier. Have you noticed kind of a way you're describing it? Have you noticed that in some cases, these characters, especially in the character development, they kind of 
take on a life of their own. And all of a sudden they're doing things you really didn't expect you were going to say they were doing. Yeah. And, you know, you had asked me earlier, how long did it take me to write the first book? Well, I can tell you the second (laughs) book is about uh, 20 or 25,000 words longer. And it took me um, much less time because of that reason. When when the characters create this life of their own, when I'm actually writing dialogue, uh, it comes natural. And and sometimes the story does take me a little bit a little bit of a different route than I expected it to go, but it's organic and it, it feels true to what the characters would actually want or how they right. would react to a situation at the time. Wonderful. So, Okay. What would you say was the, the difference between the two books? All right. I don't want to give any spoiler alerts or anything here, but uh, uh, how does the story continue in a general way in book two? Um, well, I think it's, uh, you know, it's, it's almost kind of like the original Star Wars in the sense that <laughs> right. a new, a new hope, you know, you're, you're learning who these characters are. You're learning who, what the world is. Um, the readers are developing relationships with the characters, but they're also learning what the fundamentals are of the world. But that's what I was um, hoping for. Yeah. So, cause, cause we fall in love with characters and we don't want to see them killed off for no reason. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Like Game of Thrones. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> you know, I, I, I'm not, I'm not over, you know, the death of, of Boromir or, um, the poor Ned Stark at this point. Oh, so the poor guy. The poor guy. <laughs> if, if my books ever become a movie and Sean Bean is involved, <laughs> that's going to be part of the contract that says he has to live. <laughs> he has to live. I so agree. But, but, but the first book kind of lays the groundwork in the history and development sure. and introduces the characters to set. Second book hits hard and fast, almost like a roller coaster. Oh, I love it! I'm uh, looking forward to it. Like, I said, yeah, because at this point, the world's kind of broken loose for Barrick. Um, he's on the run for his life at this point, and the second book follows his arc as he travels on and his journey continues. But it also follows other arcs um, where I show the insights of the Dominion. The Dominion is ruled by a king, but they have a council who essentially the reader will become very familiar with. Um, they don't see the king near as much, um, but that's an arc that I follow. That way the reader can kind of see how is this empire coming to the decisions that they are right. and how do they respond to these new things that they're that coming upon them. For instance, Beric actually winning a fight or a battle against legionnaires, which does not happen exactly so, exactly yeah. what's your vision of how many books you're thinking this is going to grow into um i i think it's gonna it's to do the story right and right and make it complete and and have it have the reader walk out of the series at the end of it and just love it um it's gonna take five books wonderful I well, believe. that yeah. makes me happy i don't like yeah, you right. <laughs> yeah and and just an update i'm um I'm about two chapters away from finishing my first draft of the third book. Oh, wonderful. So I should have that published um, within the next six to eight months. Okay. Well, that, that sounds yeah. wonderful. I'm the type, and I imagine probably a lot of our listeners are too, I'm the type that when I get into a series, I would like to know I'm going to be there for some time. Um, mm-hmm. It's not that I dislike short series because I do like them. But again, when we started this interview, you know, I compared you and, and, and again, I mean, in all sincerity to the Shannara series and such. And, uh, you know, Terry Brooks, I really do. I mm-hmm. get a very big and I hope that's a compliment to you. I take a, Thank I you very a, much. It a is. very Terry Brooks feeling here. And that is one of the things I enjoyed. OK, well, I fall in love with these characters and I got to be with them for quite some time. Mm-hmm. You know, and then eventually he takes in the the uh, the direction of doing prequels, you know, and things of that nature and how the world got to this place in, in the first place. And uh, yeah. so, yeah, I, I get that feeling with you. So I'm glad to hear that we're looking at at least five books. So, yes. Yeah. I, and when I when I decided to when I realized that it was going to be a series, um I started to kind of map it out because I have certain events that I want to hit. And I was thinking, well, maybe it'll be three books. And then I started writing the second book and I realized the world is too big. There's too <laughs> many characters. And, and in order to give them justice, 
and have the reader really enjoy the series, it needs to be done right. And I, I think five books will definitely do that. All right. Uh, one of the, one of the things I do love about Tolkien, um, and even in retrospect with what Peter Jackson did with the films, The Lord of the Rings, the great thing is it was such a, such a story that drew you in. But then once it was over, it was clean and it was tight and you could walk away from it feeling really good because you completed this journey with them. I will agree with that. Absolutely. Uh, my wife and I talk about this quite a bit. We will mm. watch a series like on TV. We'll watch a series. And if it ends bad, <laughs> we will never watch it again. <laughs> or, yeah. it, or it ends knowing that, okay, there should have been an, another uh, season and they never did it. Yeah. Well, that turns me off. And you are quite correct. <clears throat> Tolkien, as much as we would have loved to have lived in that world <laughs> you know, much longer, mm -hmm. it did feel we had closure. It was important. Yeah. It was it was a journey that, that you started. And by the end of it, you felt good and it was clean. And it felt clean. And that's the biggest thing that I want my readers to have as they go through this, this kind of magical journey with Barrick and Hamzy and Emma and Lily. Um, by the end of it, I want them to walk away from it and feel really good about it, knowing that there's, there's closure. It's wrapped up and they don't, and the questions that they've had have been answered. Good. Would you, what would you say is probably the most difficult part of being a writer? Um, well, well I, I know with my story, I've, there's, there's a lot of characters and the most difficult part for me is how do I, how do I manage a story that's epic in scope with, with a lot of characters and a lot of depth, but how do I streamline it and keep it um, fairly linear in the sense that I don't lose my reader? Um, right. One of, one of the tough things about reading Lord of the Rings as we go back to it is there's just the time period that it was written. Some of it is very hard to follow at times um, for modern readers. Um, I almost wanted to write Aslam in a way that is almost more, I guess, like a Western. In sure. the sense that in, in the sense that I. Even though I've got all these characters and locations and things, I want to keep it as small in scope when I'm actually in the chapter. That way the reader isn't going, oh, boy, well, you know, who is this or, or what's happening here? Where am I? Um, so I try to keep it as streamlined as possible and keep it on a smaller scope while writing an epic story. And, and I love that. I really do. When it comes to fantasies, I like them to be more of on, a, on an epic level. You know, where mm -hmm. it's, I know that this is a very rich and detailed world and it will go on for some time. Yes. So <clears throat> do you have any, okay, so we're looking at, uh, all goes well, I think a, a, a book series here of five books. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have any other future projects that you're going to be working on? Is this going to be your only endeavor or do you plan on going no, further? No, I've, I've, I've got the bug at this point. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I really enjoy it. Um, I've kind of been tinkering with some other ideas. I think in terms of fantasy, this will, this might be it for me. Right. Um, not, not because I don't love the genre or anything like that. Um, it just feels like when I developed the story, I had such a good thing that once I'm done with it, it'll, it's, it'll be my fantasy piece or my fantasy series. Wonderful. I don't think there's anything that I, that I, that I'll do or come up with that'll kind of top what I've already created. <laughs> so, um, I have, I have some other ideas, but I've still got, I've still got two and a half books at this point to write. Absolutely. So. <laughs> absolutely. And the books are not small, you know, which no. is, which is good. I, again, epic. We want to be, yeah. you know, for myself, I can tell you as a, as a reader of these types of books, we really want to be immersed for a while. You mm -hmm. know, we want to yeah. get to know. Okay. So do you, how did you feel that publishing your first book changed it or did it change your process of writing getting through that first publishing? Um, I don't think it, it, it changed my process a little bit in the sense that, um, with the first book, my, my editing time was more based on what you would just consider a normal edit where, right. you know, I, I got to make sure everything's good. Now that I'm kind of in, now that I've written the second book and the third book, my editing process has changed in the sense that I have to make sure that I don't have um, 
uh, issues with the characters. You know, I, I need to make sure that it comes across where it makes sense. Right. And with that, with that, I, I have to keep a real sharp track of how do certain characters know each other? Um, Absolutely. You know, what, what, what are their feelings towards these other people? How do they react when they haven't seen them for a while? And then all of a sudden they're together again. Because the so, readers will pounce on you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, you, you really, I, I really have to make sure that those issues are clean. And I, that way it's not something that a reader reads and goes, well, that doesn't make sense because these people don't even really know each other. Right. Right. Um, so with that, you know, I have a whole Excel spreadsheet where with, <laughs> with all my characters and locations Wonderful. and, and as I'm writing the story, um, I've got the other drafts, uh, the drafts of the first two books open. So if I need to research my own writing to make sure that I'm sharp with an interaction, sure, um, I can do it. What so do you... that that's the biggest challenge at this point. Okay. What would you think is the hardest type of scene? I don't want to say the hardest scene because I don't want to give away uh, some of the parts of the book. But what do you think as, as a, a writer is the hardest kind of scene for you to write? The biggest challenge... I don't know if there's a hardest, but the biggest challenge I've had while writing the third book is, is a major battle scene. Right. The first time that we have open warfare between, between two competing armies. Um, That's a lot of detail. I, yeah, it was, it was challenging in the sense that I, I realized that I wanted to show the battle from the perspective of a couple different characters. Nice. Um, and I wanted to make sure that that I, that I really got it right. And when I went back and read through it, and this was probably about a month ago, when I went back and read through my ma first major battle scene that I wrote, I ended up deleting like three or four pages. <laughs> I just said, <laughs> I said, this, this isn't doing the justice that a, that a battle would right. need. Um, so that, that took a while. I wanted to make sure that those couple of chapters really came across right. Um, and that was, that was kind of a first for me. So that was probably the most difficult. Okay. Um, go ahead. With that in mind, um, would you say that this was, cause again, if we want to allude back to Tolkien, you could say that it kind of goes both ways. The Hobbit was more children, though adults, of course, love it. And Lord of the Rings mm -hmm. got a little bit darker, a little bit more deeper. Who would you say would be the A? And I don't want to really say that. I don't want to ask this question in such a way that it excludes any age group. But who yeah. do you think that this more speaks to, the age group that this these series uh, speaks to? You know, I, I, I think it's. I think it probably falls into more of a young adult. Right. Um, uh -huh. If it, if it were a movie, it's it's more of a PG thirteen. Okay. Um, you know, I'm. I don't. I'm obviously not using the language that that a pure adult book would. Um, the the worst word that I use in it is the S word. <laughs> and, and right from from that perspective, I mean, I, I think any 13 or 14 year old, um, you know, is fairly familiar with that word. And that's about the worst they're going to see. Exactly. Um, I do deal, you know, there is some, there is violence, obviously. It's, of course. if you're right in a medieval world, there's, there's going to be some brutal violence involved. That's right. Um, and there, and there are some dark themes, um, but nothing, nothing that I feel would push it out of the realm of, you know, middle school or early high school. Okay. I think, I think a 14 or a 15 year old could pick up this story and read it and really, really enjoy it. And it wouldn't be, in a front to their, to their parents or their upbringing. Absolutely. But I, I would like to make at least my point of view clear here too, for the listeners, in case they're wondering, it, it is for myself, uh, again, those who are young at heart, um, mm -hmm. that a young adult book is, can very much be enjoyed by people who are much older. Uh, because mm -hmm. again, it takes us to a simpler, a simpler time and we're not dealing with <laughs> the dramas that we find on TV, you know, there were things yeah. that it, it reminds us of the younger days and things yeah. of that nature. And so I, I personally still love young adult books. I, I love yeah. it because it's, it's uh, there's a little bit more innocence and yet we still yeah. have, like you said, we still have the, the richness of the world. Yeah. Well, and I, I think Aslam kind of falls somewhere in between, right. um, 
Lord of the Rings and, and, you know, Song of Fire and Ice or Game of Thrones. Very, absolutely. In the, in the sense that, um, the, the council of the Dominion, when they meet and they have these council meetings, there's a political element that's involved where, where an older reader could really, can really see a lot of the inner workings. Um, and I, that was really fun to write. And it's, it was really interesting because you get to see these villains, what their motivations are. Um, and I think that, that part really appeals to an older crowd, um, who will really catch on to kind of the subtle nuance of the, the bureaucracy and the politics that are involved to run this empire. Um, so that was nice. I, I think it provides a little bit, a little bit for everybody to grab onto is the different story arcs weave over each other throughout the chapters. Um, I think individual readers will grasp onto individual characters or certain story arcs and really be excited when a chapter comes up again that showcases right. Emma and Lily's journey or, right. or the Dominion Council meets again to develop their next kind of sinister plan. Okay. So, so uh, one last question and then we'll, we'll tie this up. And this is kind of, again, a more of a little get to know the author a little bit more. What is a day in the life of BG Franklin? Like <laughs> when it comes to writing, do you try to write every day or, or do you, um, what's your writing I, style? I don't, I don't necessarily write every day, um, but I will write for, I'll write maybe every other day or every, you know, right. every three days. But when I sit down, I'll, I'll sit down and I'll dedicate a substan- substantial amount of time. I'll, I'll sit down for five or six hours right. um, in, the, in the evening. Um, music is a big part of it. Um, that's, that's why I love your station so much. Ah, it's, it's, a lot, it's a lot of that. It's a lot of that music that I'll actually listen to while I write. Because it helps kind of put me into the world that I'm writing. Absolutely. Um, and so, so I'll sit down and I'll write, you know, for typically in the evenings for a couple of hours or, or more and, and just take it as I go. Okay. Where can this series be found? I, I know Amazon is one obvious. I mean, is, is that where it's mainly yeah. uh, purchased from? Yes. Yeah. Amazon is, is, is the best bet. Um, I've, there's, there's ebook with it. As well, you can get it on your Kindle if you'd like. Um, I, I do free book giveaways through Amazon, you know, approximately every quarter. Typically, when I do these, um, I'll do both the books together. So if if a reader wants to get both of them at one time for a Kindle, they can, which is really nice. Um, Very but nice. Amazon is the main way to get it. Um, I'm also really proud to announce that um, it will be coming to Audible. Um, wonderful wonderful yeah i i <laughs> i i have a very talented um voice actor named jake harding um who can be found at jakehardingvo.com and jake has agreed to do this and and he's he's so talented that after reading hearing his audition i realized this is the guy that i want to do the entire series out so hopefully that works out and just another avenue for the reader to well, to hear the story i am really happy to hear that because uh i do uh sometimes i will do a lot of lecturing and mm-hmm. I will have to obviously during the pandemic that diminished somewhat. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but I can believe um, it. I would. I'm not a flyer. Do not care to fly. So I will mm-hmm. drive. I don't care where it's at. I will drive yeah. multiple states to get somewhere. And uh, that is one. That is my favorite thing to do. Is I will pop in an, uh, an audiobook. Yeah. So when that comes out, I will be one of your first. Yeah, uh, first I've got customers. a lot of friends in the army. You know. I'm not sure if they can't read or what, <laughs> but, but they said, they said, Hey man, you know, put your, put your book on audible. And so finally now I've, I've got that in the works and, and Wonderful. that'll be done here soon. Well, so. that is going to, I think, make a lot of people very happy. Okay. So it's on Amazon. Again, the book series is the As- Azalom. I'm saying that correct, right? The, the yep. Absalom series, uh, book one is out, is Absalom Rise of the Mountain God, and book two, Absalom the Shattered Accord, they are both out. And as we've just heard, the audibles are eventually on their way, and you are currently working on book three. I am. I oh. am. I'm, re- I'm getting near the end of book three. <laughs> um, and then just one other thing for, Please. for your listeners. Um, you know, since I, I'm a small independent author, so right. at this point, I, I have the ability to to answer any questions that may be had. So with that, um, if any, 
anybody has any feedback or anything they'd like to share, um, I can be reached at Azalom at Outlook.com. Outstanding. Um, so if, if there's any questions or they just want to know maybe a little bit about the story or, or how I came to this decision with a character or whatever it may be, or even if they think it's rotten, then <laughs> well, no, you know, actually, any, <clears throat> any feedback that, that if they want to get in touch with me on a more personal level, um, Aslam at outlook.com. Okay. And that Aslam is A Z E L O M L O M. Yes. At yeah. outlook.com. Outstanding yeah. people really do enjoy being able to have a more of a personal relationship with the author. Mm -hmm. Um, Watch out for groupies. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but no, I think that's wonderful that you're doing that. All right. Well, uh, Brian, I appreciate this. Um, the, the, again, from my perspective, I very much am um, enjoying the first book. Very Terry Brooks kind of feel. But again, you are your own author. You have your own style and flavor to it, which I appreciate. So I look forward to the rest of the series coming out. And I appreciate you taking the time for our listeners. All right. Well, thank you very much. 